of you may remember the scene from the Blues Brothers movie um, where Jake, who was played by John Belushi, says, me and the Lord have an understanding to which his brother Elwood, played by Dan Aykroyd, replies, we're on a mission from God. And this has all happened after a stirring sermon by the Reverend Cleophas James, played none other by the great James Brown. And Jake sees the light, and he senses a call to raise $5,000 to cover the back taxes for the orphanage where he and Elwood were raised. Me and the Lord have an understanding. We're on a mission from God. The stories we have heard this morning included dedicated characters who also have an understanding with God and have accepted a call to be on a mission from God minus the car crashes and the cussing, but on a mission from God, complete with their own astonishing scenes that rival all those cinematic fabrications. So I invite us to look at these stories and see how the understanding of God's missional call, their commitments to God and each other, their blind spots and their reactions, might illumine and challenge and encourage us as we continue to discern and pursue our own call. In the second Kings text, Elijah's time as a prophet is almost over. God is getting ready to send a whirlwind to transport him directly into God's presence. But prior to his Beam me up, Scotty, moment. God has just a few more directions. God sends Elijah to Bethel and Jericho and the Jordan River. And each time Elijah tells Elisha, stay here, Elisha responds, as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So they take off. And at each place, the prophets are met by groups of other prophets. And at Bethel and Jericho, these prophets say to Elisha, Hey, don't you know the Lord's going to take your master today? And Elisha's response is, Yes, don't talk about it. When Elijah and Elisha arrive at the Jordan, sure enough, there's another group of prophets, but they keep their distance. The two prophets walk to the riverbank where Elijah rolls up his coat and strikes the river. Just as the Israelites experience when they escape Egypt, the waters part and the two prophets walk across on dry land. Time is getting short and Elijah asks Elisha for any last request. And Elisha responds, let me have twice your spirit. Elijah says, that's a pretty hard request. He says, if you see me as I am taken, it will be yours. And if not, it won't. They continue walking and talking until a fiery chariot and fiery horses come from the skies, separate them, and take Elijah up in a whirlwind. And Elisha looks and looks and looks until he can't see anymore. And when Elijah disappears from sight, Elisha rips his clothes in two. Have you ever had a mentor or a teacher who changed your life? A mentor or teacher who sort of shows up out of the blue like Elijah did with Elisha while he's plowing with oxen and he, he tosses his coat over Elisha's shoulders. A mentor or a teacher who sees more in you than you can see in yourself. A mentor, a teacher, 
who shares their mission and their vision, shares the inner workings of their heart, their passions and their commitments. And over the course of time, that mission and vision, those passions and commitments become your own. If some mentor or teacher has inspired you so much, trusted your awkward learnings and your not yet fully, fully formed abilities, if they've helped you hear your own heart, open your eyes to see God and how God is working in your life and world, then you know why Elisha could not and would not leave Elijah's side. Then you know why Elisha asked for whatever would make him more like Elijah. Their shared mission from God was to bring the wayward, disobedient Israelites back to faith in God despite an oppressive and evil political system. Their shared mission was to remind the Israelites of God's unwavering covenantal love, to remind them of their own identity as God's covenantal partners. It was this shared mission, and it was so much more. And it was a shared mission that Elijah entrusted to Elisha, quite literally passing the mantle per God's direction, not trying to turn Elisha into a second Elijah, but trusting God and God's work in Elisha's life to carry on this mission. And then Elijah shows up in our gospel story from Mark. Jesus has been busy. He has been busy healing folks and fussing with the Pharisees and casting out demons and feeding five, 4,000 and quizzing his disciples about who do people say I am, with one answer being Elijah, and finally predicting his own death, which was not well received by the disciples, especially Peter. And it was after all this pouring out that Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to a high mountain, and right there before their very eyes, Jesus' clothes and his countenance become blazingly brilliant. I imagine Peter, James, and John trying to shield their eyes as their minds try to figure out what is happening. But there's more because in their midst, they see Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus and Peter. Peter blurts out the first thing that comes to his terrified mind as he's trying to make sense of all this. He goes, wow, it's great that we're all here together, as if he himself is the host. He says, let's build a building for each of you. As if all of this mind-blowing and mind-numbing and inexplicable and perhaps nearly paralyzing things are going on, they are covered with a cloud, and a voice speaking from the cloud says, this is my son whom I dearly love. Listen to him. As they return their attention back from the clouds, they find Elijah and Moses gone. And as they come down from the mountain, Jesus tells them, speak of this to no one, not until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Jesus, like Elijah, chooses and invites folks to join him in his mission from God. And these three guys are given an opportunity to go even deeper into that mission than the other formal nine. They get special time with Jesus, complete with this bewildering, fantastic, jaw-dropping, terrifying experience. And these th three guys know now for sure that Jesus is not Elijah because he saw, they saw, the two of them talking together. They also see Jesus so bathed in love and the power of God that his entire being 
is transformed. And they hear the voice of God entreating them to listen, to understand, to emulate the beloved Son of God. Jesus is still on a mission from God. He is anointed to bring God's kingdom to earth, to show us what God's kingdom looks like, to teach us and remind us to work for God's purposes on earth as they are in heaven, that we are messengers of new light and love into a world that thinks that darkness and death reign. And Jesus' invitation is for us to join that mission, and it's just as strong today as it was on that dazzling day. If you've read the Gospel of Mark, you'll know that the disciples do not get painted in a very positive light. They misunderstand Jesus' teaching. They fail to appreciate his power. They seek status over service. They sleep when Jesus wants them awake, and they scatter when he is arrested. And yet, Jesus continues to nudge them towards faithfulness in spite of themselves. And I dare say that on most days, we are more like the disciples than we care to admit. We get scared and we say stupid stuff. We hurt others and ourselves, sometimes by what we say and do, and other times by what we do not say and do not do. We fail to see God's glory, and we are deaf to God's voice, even though we deeply long for life on earth as it is in heaven. Beloved, we are on a mission from God, and God longs to empower us, and God longs to walk with us. Like the song says, God longs to anoint us and appoint us. God longs for us to see ourselves and each other as God sees us, for us to spend time and energy in God's presence so that we might be better equipped to witness, for us to remember God's deep, abiding, and merciful love for us and for God's entire world. God longs for us to be so bathed in God's love and power that we are transformed. <laughs>